So. So. When it comes to something which involves things with names like Little Willie, Big Willie, and Winston Churchill, it's sort of irresistible catnip to most historians. It just is. But, when you're talking about the ability to actually show a committee can be useful, that a committee can succeed, it's such an amazing occurrence, such an unthought of occurrence, such an unexpected occurrence, that it's practically overwhelming. I mean, think about this. The tradition in British political history, the tradition in most nations' history, is committees are where you send things to die. You can make a big passionate speech about the importance of a topic. And then you can say, but of course, I am but one view, and we must listen to all those who have important things to say, and so we will give this to, insert appropriate name of, committee. To inquire. And that committee in turn, will have hearings, and hearings, and hearings. It may even someday write a report, but we all know one thing, it will take so long, involve the expulsion of so much hot air, that absolutely fudge all, fudge, fudge, fudge all, will come from it in the end. Eh. However, occasionally, occasionally committees really are used appropriately. Occasionally, they really are a group of experts and passionate people brought together to solve a problem. Just occasionally. The most interesting thing about this whole committee is the story of land ships. And the reason they're called land ships and the story of the, you know, tanks and all these things. Why it starts off with is it starts off with the Admiralty. It's another story which is the very opposite of what quite a lot of popular history will present to you. This was something I found when I was doing a lot of work on 1920s and 30s and for my PhD thesis and for the stuff which eventually re led to this book. Second edition of which, which includes a paperback version, coming on the 30th of October. You can, It is available to pre-order and if enough pre-orders go through the ab the websites for the US Naval Institute and Pen and Sword, who knows? They might even release it early. They did last time for the first edition. And I just would love to have that phone call again. Purely from the point of view of... Yes, that I mean that's going to arrive in time for my tax bill in January. But also ego. Let's be honest, ego. Academics don't have much, okay? We have how successful our books are. And we have whether or not anyone turns up to our lectures. That is our entire basis of our ego. Okay, occasionally if you win a very prestigious grant or medal or you get nominated for some sort of prize in, you know, in your field. Those are lovely things, but the main things for Ego are how well our books sell and how many people turn up to our lectures. It works. The thing about all this research is that Quite a lot of time when I was looking through a lot of the books, which were general history ones, that they have this sort of mantra of battleship admirals who don't embrace new technology. And A, that's quite 
full sin itself because the the whole idea is the battleship admirals were steeped in the wool and been around for generations and then you realize that the battleship admirals that they're talking about could only exist because of new technologies of direct to fire control uh radio telegraphy and all sorts of things which had come through which allowed them to communicate and work and aim their guns and do the long range firing and all those things came in it's sort of going there hang on that stuff is all less than 15 20 years old um you you cannot be steeped in tradition of battleship admirals after 20 years it just doesn't work like that in the uk it's not considered a tradition if it's less than a century old even, and definitely not a steep tradition until it's at least five centuries old. And that's if we're being very generous. I.e. that has to be something which is really popular, usually involving the royal family. Not mere mortals. So... It's sort of unsurprising to me then, based on all this, even though I did know this story before, but when I started looking into it, the Landship Committee, that it does end up happening with the Royal Navy. That Morris Hackney gets a word from the then Colonel Ernest Swinton about his ideas. Morris Hankey, who was the Naval Assistant Secretary to the Committee of Imperial Defence from 1912 19, uh, from 1908 to 1912, and from 1912 to 1938, the Secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defence, the Senior Secretary of it, is a key person to hear about this. Now, here is the thing. You cannot get anyone more powerful more career civil servant than Hanky. You also can't get anyone who had a better strategic understanding of the situation of Britain in the period. I know there are his detractors. There are lots of people who like to say uh, he didn't get see this coming, he didn't see that coming, he didn't see that coming. You know, they, they're always good at pointing out all the things he got wrong. He made a lot of the right decisions. He gave a lot of the right advice. He got a lot more right than he got wrong. A lot more right than he got wrong. And one of the things as Secretary of the Committee of Imperial Defense he could do, and this was a really powerful thing, is he could direct information where it needed to go. And he had the choice. He could have gone to the War Office... With the information, he could have gone to the Prime Minister's office to ask of him directly. When you look at the whole setting up of the Committee of Imperial Defence, you soon realise that he can go wherever he likes. There are all sorts of subcommittees and committees that he could get involved with, and he could send the information to. So, he's the guiding light for how things begin. You persuade him, you've won half your battle. And the odds are, unless you are a really steeped, deeply interested person in, ter in British strategic culture and British strategic decision making in World War One, the odds are you will have probably either not heard of him or just read of him and thought he was just another bureaucrat and he wasn't he was the bureaucrat if you want to compare him to someone you would be putting him in the same category as peeps you would be looking at someone like that who is a absolute one in One in a million organizational brain. Now, he was the senior civil servant for the Committee of Imperial Defense, which reported directly to the cabinet. He was in charge. All the civil servants reported to him. He attended all the subcommittees. He attended all the committee hearings. And he also was often attended, 
couldn't vote, of course, because he was a civil servant, but he would attend Cabinet. To act as a resource. The Committee of Imperial Defence is a clearinghouse. It exists in peace and war. It is how the British government function and form a unified defence policy. What's even interesting is that members of it do not necessarily come from just the ruling party. It's an organisation which is... Almost impossible to see how it functioned in a modern political environment. You could not. And that is something we've lost as a nation. But it's not just Britain which has lost that capability. Committees which could function where they could deal with people of all hues coming together and going, this is a serious enough topic that we're going to leave the politics and partisanship to the, to at the door and we are going to work on this together to work out what is the sensible policy. Rare. And Yes. Please note when I say this stuff on politics. Everyone would like to blame the other side in this political debate of why this has happened. But everyone is equally guilty. Okay? Doesn't matter your hue of your politics. Every side. There is no side. That is good. It's kind of like Warhammer 40k. You have in there a faction called the Tau. Who believe in the greater good. And they're doing everything for the greater good. And the greater good sometimes justifies invading other, other planets. And forcing them to join the Tau Empire. Because otherwise they'll be attacked by someone nastier. Hanky knows exactly who he needs to get involved. There is... There are many advantages and disadvantages to Churchill's personality at various stages in his career. One of the big advantages to him is he's always happy to run with ideas. He'll sometimes, he'll sometimes, he'll often claim credit for them. And they're not always the best ideas, but he will run with ideas. He will actually put the effort into it. And he will actually get things done. I think that's something which is sometimes misunderstood about him, in that we almost presume that previous generations of politicians were all more proactive than the current ones are. That the idea of, let's wait and see. Is something new. Unfortunately, Prime Minister Asquith is a very good example of let's wait and see. We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see in terms of the politics of the time. And he is not alone. There are lots of politicians in the period who were wait and see. So when Hankey goes to Churchill rather than the War Office, rather than any of the other departments, He's going to a minister who has got a department that is technically inclined, technically motivated, and technically capable. But more importantly, he's also going to a minister who's going to proactively run with the idea. And honestly, Hanky doesn't give a flying hoot about who gets the credit. That's not his thing. His thing? Is that Britain wins the war. His thing is. 
that we have to have a solution to the issues of trench warfare. His thing is that we need to find some way to bring the advantages of mobile firepower that fleets enjoy to the land. And there are lots of discussions, lots of discussions going on at this time about what can be done for trench warfare, how trench warfare can be solved, how you can get through all that barbed wire across all that mud. And Trust me, there were a lot of discussions which were based around the sheer firepower of the gunboats when it was fighting on the Belgian coast. The way the Royal Navy had handed that, handed that fighting, there were a lot of army officers who were looking at going, we like that. But the trouble is, for us it's artillery. And that means it's indirect fire. That's not really the same. It's useful. Let's be honest, the artillery was then the king of the battlefield, is today the king of the battlefield. It's the absolute undisputed ruler of the battlefield. If you want talking about casualties inflicted in battle, artillery wins every single time in sheer volume. Now, of course, after Gallipoli... Churchill ends up back in the army. That's where he goes to. And he goes off and actually fights. Again. Good and bad, and there are lots for both. He does actually put his money where his mouth is. He doesn't just send other people, he goes himself. You could argue it's because he believes honestly nothing will happen to him, but he goes. Now, I will put a link to the actual article that this came from. Because it comes from an Australian art newspaper article where it claims an Australian came up with the idea of a tank long before the British government actually pushed for it. Which is not unsurprising, because let's be honest, it's not exactly an innovative new idea. There have been ideas of various tanks going around since the medieval period. The thing is how you build and how you put it together. And I do agree, looking at the Australian idea, that does seem very, very close to what actually results. But the trouble is, they took no notice of the Australian gentleman, and they carried on in their own fashion. But... This is one of the paragraphs from a letter Churchill wrote to Asquith. The question to be now solved is not the long attack over a carefully prepared glacis of former times, but the actual getting across 100 or 200 yards of open space and wire entanglements. All this was apparent more than two months ago, but no steps have been taken and no preparations made. Yet it would be quite easy to fit up tractors with armoured shelters, in which men and machine guns could be placed, which would be bulletproof. The caterpillar system would enable trenches to be crossed quite easily, and the weight of machines would destroy all the wire entanglements. These engines could advance into the enemy's trenches, smash all obstructions, and sweep the trenches with their machine gun fire. Now... If you're sitting there listening to this and thinking, well, hang on, with all this passion, why is Churchill the Secretary of Navy, ra uh, why is he Lord of the Admiralty rather than Secretary of, the war, or Secretary of War in charge of the army? And honestly, if you'd heard him at various earlier cabinet meetings, etc., when they're deciding the process and progress of World War One. Uh, you would have thought he was, because he basically spent his entire time going, yes, we will support the army. We will support the army, not and not putting forward an entirely any uh, kind of idea of um, separate naval policy at all. He just doesn't. But, Saying that, he's First Lord of the Admiralty. 
And that means he has at his disposal a massive technical department, including a absolutely superlative egghead of an engineer. And he turns around to him, Eustace Tennyson Denicourt, his director of naval construction, who's used to working with third sea lords of the like of Jellico, etc., and going, What brainwave are you having right about now? What am I going to have to create now? Or Fisher, and going. He would outlast them all. Let's be honest, he does outlast them all. He's in position till 1924. Basically, the moment he's no longer able to build battleships, he goes, See ya! Wouldn't want to be ya. I'm going to go off and earn some money in the private, in uh, private industry. They took away the things I like to build. By treaty. There's a loss to the treaty system. Anyway. Then a court goes, well, um, what can I say? I'm a ship guy. Okay, I understand what weapons are probably one of, and, and the weights and displacements and engineering and all these things, but I'm not really, I, I don't do much to do with land vehicles. I can probably figure something out. And this may explain some of the shapings of some of the earlier designs. Because let's be honest, when you look at them, you're sort of going, hmm, hmm, hmm. That looks like a boat. Yeah. But what he does have, as over and above his qualifications and his skills and engineer, he also has contacts. Reams of them. Absolute reams of them. He knows all sorts of people in industry. All sorts of people in various companies. But also in the various departments of the government. And one of the people he managed to track down quite quickly is a guy called Thomas Gerard Hevington, who managed to, in his career, serve in the Army, the Navy, and the Royal Air Force. That takes skill. He was uh, a flight commander of the Royal Navy's Royal Naval Air Service's Armoured Car Squadron. Okay, here is the point. The Royal Navy finds they are flying aircraft from in Belgium to assist the army and over the trenches. Okay, then they find they keep losing, their pilots get shot down in no man's land, and there's no one going to collect them. This annoys the Royal Navy. The Royal Navy turn around to Rolls Royce and go, So, those rather large trucks you call personal cars? Yes! We like armor and we like machine guns. That didn't necessarily go to plan. And so they ended up going to another company as well called Wolseley. And. How do I describe their armoured cars? <laughs> okay, well, someone basically decided that the Royal Naval Air Service needed even heavier armoured cars, and they got them. They got them, and they got a lot of them. They eventually had well, how do I put this politely? Twenty squadrons of Royal Navy armored cars. And when you think they had started off with um, please note, this is a description of the first Rolls Royce. Basically, a guy called Commander Charles Sampson. 
took a Maxim gun on one vehicle, tested it out. He then went and had a chat with the shipbuilders in Dunkirk to add boilerplate to his Rolls Royce and a Mercedes, which he'd captured off the Germans. And that's when they turn around and get Rolls Royce and Wolseley back home to start producing them. Next person is Colonel Wilfred Dumble of the Naval Brigade, who is one of those people from history who manages to uh, wander around. He's a former Royal Engineer. He had managed the London Omnibus Company. And he had been in charge of transport for the Royal Navy Division in Antwerp and uh, had served in part of the Naval Brigade as well. And he suggests another gentleman, Colonel R.E.B. Crompton, who was trying to develop, well, was working on cross-country vehicles for the army. At this time, uh, as he was an expert in heavy traction. Now, pl let me. How do I describe Crompton? Well, I've got two pictures of him up there for a reason. This is a list of some of the projects that he worked on in his life. Um, the National Grid, standardization of. Voltage, frequency, current for various systems and symbols across circuit diagrams. Uh, basically helped create the... Um, well, when I say create, helped create the Institute of Electro, uh, Electrical Engineers and the Inst International Electrotechnical Commission. Um, he dropped the constitution for the International Electrotechnical Commission which is one of those organizations which you don't hear about, but which our modern world is founded on. He built all sorts of weird things. He built roads. He built heavy vehicles. He's a founding member of the Royal Automobile Club. Um, worked heavily in electric lighting. And one of the companies he founded, or please I say one of the companies he founded, was the world's first large-scale manufacturers of electrical equipment. He is absolutely amazing. He actually got the Faraday Medal awarded. Now, for those who don't know what the Faraday Medal is, it's a medal awarded by the UK Institution of Engineering and Technology, when it's now called, but it was of course previously called the Institution of Electrical Engineers. And it is widely recognized as one of those awards which are just one below a Nobel Prize. And probably because he didn't make startling discoveries, he doesn't get a Nobel Prize. He's one of those people who makes everything work. Someone else has the startling discovery goes, I have this great idea about this cool thing in theory. Crompton is the guy who turns around and goes, Right then, I can apply it in this way, this way, this way, and can make it all work. So this committee is put together. You might be starting to think, well, hang on, this is kind of like the A-Team. This is, this is the Avengers team up. They Basically, they've gone and got four really quite smart people who really know what they're doing and what they're about and are putting them together and told them to come with a solution. I can see why this committee worked. It's absolutely nuts, but it will work. And that's the thing, it did. The committee's activities were concealed with the assistance of the Prime Minister's Office from Lord Kitchener, the head of the army, the War Office, the Board of the Admiralty, 
the Treasury, everyone. They were helped by the Marquis of Salisbury, who very happily let them use his house, Hatfield House, which is not exactly a small property. It's a, it's a grade one listed... Um, it's in Hatford, Hertfordshire in the UK. Uh, if you look it up, you'll see it's a, it's a fairly nice looking... I suppose you might be able to find a room to stay if you were there, you know, in that period. I, I, there might be just about space for you. If you look at it and you think it looks, it makes Hampton Court Palace look a little bit small and unstately, don't worry, you're not the first to think that. They conducted a huge amount of trials and they tested various wheeled and track vehicles. And they started this in February 1915. And it's July 1915 their existence comes to attention of the War Office because they've managed to get Little Willie, this vehicle, in this form, with the steering carriage behind it, working. At which point the army co cooks up a massive hoobla and insists on taking over it. But they got this far. They also had Big Willie as well. Now, Big Willie, we can't, well, I can't find a decent picture of. I found a very grainy, horrid one, which actually didn't show me anything. And nothing else. Nothing else at all. So if you have a decent picture of Big Willie... And I'm talking about the tank here, the rhomboid tank that looks sort of like this Mark I vehicle. I'd be very interested in seeing it. Not anything else, okay? I will say this. Anything else comes through, you might not enjoy my response. You probably won't. So... The rhomboid-shaped tank is chosen because of its reliability in crossing land. And this has been successful. It's, it's rather interesting. The army jumps in the moment they think it's going to be successful. They try and get members transferred from the Navy to the army. They include, they try and get Euston Den uh, uh, Eustace Denicourt. And basically he comes around and goes, yeah, no. Battleships. Battleships. This was an interesting hobby for, like, five months. Starts off February, starts off February 1915 in terms of committee, and July 1915, it's take, the army learns about it and takes over. So, basically, five months they go from, there is nothing to, we have something. Yeah, it's useful. From December 1915, the word tank was adopted as codename for the vehicles, and the Land Ship Committee eventually became known as the Tank Supply Committee. It is started off as the DNC's committee, the Director of Known Constructions Committee. And again, it's completely the whole way through nondescript. Oh, DNC's committee. Eh, he's got so many. One of the interesting things, though, of history to think about, and this is today's question, is if, if the army doesn't take over when it does, there is a strong chance that the first of these vehicles end up going to the Western Front as part of the Royal Naval Air Service armoured car formations. 
So the armored car, the, the, basically, as part of the land forces belonging to the air force of the naval service. <laughs> Because, I kid you not, they were working through that as an idea. They're working through the options of sending them out like that. And who knows how they could have been sent out, because it's most likely they would have gone with naval gunnery, in terms of weapons chosen. They, you could... One of the interesting things about sort of the Mark Vs, etc., is they have six pounders on them, 57 millimeters. Now, the Royal Navy has a lot of six pounders wandering around in terms of 57 millimeters and those things, but they also have things which are slightly bigger. And there was a debate at the beginning, while it was under naval control, as to whether to stick with a central turret and have a bigger gun or have these side turrets and sponsons. There is a potential that you end up with a central turret with a bigger gun and some side guns as well. There was actually some options which they were looking, which they were considering, which gives you a sort of thinking of going of hang on, I've seen this vehicle before, I've seen that vehicle. Where have I seen that vehicle? Well. Here you go. Sponsons, central turret. <laughs> Rhomboid is shape. <laughs> to an extent. And I just love that bit of history. Still haven't built those. I need to get that around. I need to have them ready for Christmas and the big family walls. Oh, good lord. That's going to be a lot of painting in October. A lot of painting in October. Alright. Anyway, I think that's going to be the question today. How do you think it would have gone if A... How do you think the tanks would have differed if the Royal Navy had been the first to deploy them? B... How do you think history would differ if the Royal Navy had been the first to deploy them? And... C. It's the uh, important thing is, uh, to an extent, is work out is, do you think we still might be dealing with an armoured section in the Royal Marines to this day, because I do sometimes think if we go back to World War One, if tanks aren't taken off the naval service when they are, and they actually end up in service with the Royal Navy as Royal Marines, Royal Navy units, going in action, the Royal Navy might keep them, because they're excellent force multipliers for landing parties. You could end up with a whole new interesting thing added into every cruiser going around the world. It could also have to have space for its tanks and the craft which get them ashore. Just You don't have helicopters. It's an organic capability. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. I will admit these videos are probably not as long as I normally make them because of what's coming up over the next, over the couple of weeks while they're going out. But also, well, some topics require more time than others. And I did kind of pick the shorter topics for this period for that specific reason. I like to make every video its appropriate length rather than worry about a certain fixed length. I'd also like to add quickly before this finishes. That is a frigating powerhouse committee. I mean, that is a committee you put together in that period. I, there aren't, there are very few things I think you could have added on. But if you add on that this committee then has this gentleman, Hanky, 
looking over its shoulder any time they have any problem. Oh, well, I have this friend. I have this solution, this option. Oh, you need to produce this. Oh, I'm sure I can sort this one through. Between him and Churchill, they managed to get all the resources they need to support those brains. There's no surprise they managed to achieve what they did so quickly. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and... Well. Let's go back to the end one. And... Take care. I need to get a Steam Deck.